Welcome to module two, safe inquiry and support. What is domestic abuse? Well, the cross government definition of domestic violence and abuse tells us that it is a pattern or incident of controlling, coercive, threatening behaviour, violence or abuse. It's for the over 16s, this definition, um, and it's those who've been intimate partners or family members, regardless of their gender or sexuality. Domestic abuse could be psychological, physical, sexual, financial or emotional. This definition also includes things such as female genital mutilation, forced marriage and so-called honour based violence and abuse. It's an important differentiation to think about what's happening between intimate partners and what's happening in a family. Both of these are covered in the definition but may be occurring separately and with slightly different dynamics. The key indicators, and these are largely based around intimate partner violence, but can apply across to adult family violence. Is there the possibility of compromise in the relationship? Can they make their mind up about basic things? Can they go out? Are they isolated from friends and family? Do they feel they have to choose between relationships? You know, is it me or them? Are you given, are, are there ultimatums given? Can they wear what they like without criticism? Did the relationship happen very fast? This may not be abnormal, some of us do this, but in association with some of the other areas, it could well be. Do they feel frightened? Fear is a big risk indicator in domestic abuse and we must be very attentive to the person's sense of fear. Do they feel free to disagree? What happens if they do? Do they feel concerned about their children's well-being? Is there alcohol or substances used to cope with life actually, to numb out the pain, the stress and the anxiety? Do they have physical injuries? Are there recurrent nebulous health symptoms? You know, we live it in our body. So am I feeling achy all the time or flat or tired? Things that might indicate that I'm under stress and pressure a lot. Is there ongoing anxiety and depression? Also, we have to look at the difference between conflict and coercion. All relationships can have conflict in them potentially. Um, and, you know, there, if there's an ideal partnership out there, then that's great. But people do argue, people do fall out, people do break up. But in a conflict situation, you're not afraid of the other person. You're not afraid of what they're going to do if you want to break up with them. It can happen in any relationship, but ultimately compromise and negotiation are possible. In a coercive relationship, the whole family is affected. There's fear and a demand for compliance, whether that is insidious or um, just out there. Negotiation and compromise aren't really possible. And if they seem possible, it's interesting to look for how it's engineered in the other direction. Potentially, there could be high levels of manipulation and there's a climate of fear in a family or a relationship where coercion is the underlying theme. So why is your response important? Well, if you ask the question of someone, what you're doing is you're valuing that person and their life, their situation. You're showing empathy for that. Now, often in our work, we'll talk to people who say, I didn't realise that it was bad enough for me to get help or I just thought maybe I was, you know, exaggerating or being dramatic, or I thought if I did things differently, it might be better. So actually asking is valuing, and it's really important for someone who's fundamentally been devalued. And then when they disclose, we can validate and acknowledge their fears and feelings. We can name the problem. So even if they're not ready for change, being able to say to someone, I don't like what's happening to you, I'm not comfortable with it, is validating that they're not imagining things. So if they're in a place where they're sort of pre-change ready, it might just allow them to have a, have a moment in their mind that they can come back to and think, OK, yeah, maybe not, maybe it isn't OK. We call this planting golden seeds. 
and your response is, is so crucial. The way you respond, the way you validate, the way you offer to just be available for when they're ready, it ensures that they feel they can disclose again and remain safe. In what we call the help seeking model, if someone gets the wrong response, they're very likely to just shift right back into not speaking. And that's what we'd like to avoid in the work. We want someone, even if they're not ready for change at the moment, to have found a compassionate response that means that they think it's going to be OK in the future to say again. So what are your barriers to asking potentially? Well, you may feel that your professional competency is being threatened. You may feel that this is something that you're then going to have to work with someone else. Maybe your ability to continue to work with this person is threatened. You know, it is a reality that sometimes we want to hold on to our clients and be the best we can for them. But in domestic abuse, a coordinated response is the key to the issue. We can't deal with this on our own. And it isn't that you have to be fully competent to be able to do everything. You have to be fully competent to work in partnership and wrap a team around that person potentially to get them the best help. It might conflict with what you see as your informed consent. So, you know, what they've agreed to talk to you about, it may sit outside of that agreement. You may feel that you have to renew that agreement, but you should always be clear with people at the start anyway, that whatever they disclose, if there's a duty, there's a duty of care. Um, so that you must, if someone is at risk or unsafe, you must attend to that through the correct processes, which we deal with in later modules. You may not have time. You might not have time to open the can of worms. The reality is we are under pressure all the time. We are doing more for less. We're doing, 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 doing. And actually, it may be that you haven't got the time to stop and think about whether you should ask. So you may not even recognize the need to do that. Or you may just be avoiding because of the pressure you're under, which is normal human response to the pressure we're under, um, opening any can of worms. So it's really important to think about time and also think about your self care and how you're in your work in a way that allows you to observe and know when to ask. You may not have the knowledge. So undertaking training and development and understanding the issues is really important. So the fact that you're watching this is great. All of the modules in this package serve to give the knowledge that anyone in the community would need to ask the question and give the right support and understand the dynamics and what you're looking for. You might worry that you'll jeopardise the professional relationship. And this is a big issue in all types of safeguarding and intervention. And of course, you might if you have to um, disclose or you have to do something with what you're told in some way, then it is possible that that person will back away from you. But this is all about the rapport and how you've established the boundaries of your empathy. Boundary empathy is really essential in the work we do. We can't be wholly empathetic in a way that actually turns into collusion. We have to have boundaries around that. Um, and very often, more often than not, if you're clear and kind about what your limits are, people understand. You might be frightened of what they're going to say. You know, this issue's touched on many of our lives. And it might be really difficult for you to hear a disclosure. So think about that. Think about whether there's an avoidance in you from hearing certain things, because that can happen. And think about how you might work around that, what sort of help you might get with that. You might also be uncertain and unconfident about what you're going to do with that disclosure when it comes. So again, you know, be competent, get training, get support, call local specialist services and talk to them about it um, and make sure that you're able to do that because asking is very, very important. Otherwise, I think sometimes it's possible that someone feels as though they've got their issues written all over them. And why doesn't anyone see it? Um, and very often, if we're looking, we do see it.
And the reason it's important to be able to spot the signs and to ask is because there are many, many barriers to telling, and these are also barriers to leaving and eventual freedom. This person knows that the person they're with is not letting go. They might be threatening self-harm. Their control might be scary, probably is. They might be using the children as a weapon and saying, you know, you're going to lose the children. I'm going to take the children, whatever that might be. They may well fear for their life. Um, that is not unusual. And with two women being murdered a week, then the reality is that you may well fear for your life. Your health may be too greatly impacted. You may feel vulnerable and unable to function on your own. This can be especially true for those with disabilities um, and whose carer is the controlling person in their life. Or maybe older people feeling trapped by their health and well-being. Very likely that people feel it's all their fault and there's no way out. Self-blame is a really important feature of what the coercion and control does to someone. So listening out for someone who self blames is really important. And conversely, if you've got someone who perpetrates abuse, who is claiming that they are a victim, which is also very common, then what you can listen out for is the fact that they don't self blame. Actually, that would be very unusual. They'll still be pushing responsibility out on someone else and, you know, shouting their victimization from the rooftops. It takes a long time for a real victim to identify themselves as being victimized very often. They're in love. You love your partner. We love our partners. You know, we go into relationships and we know people's faults. We know their childhood difficulties. We want to support them and love them and nurture them. And there is love that happens. There's also codependent love that happens. And we have to be aware of that, that there can be very, very deeply unconscious hooks keeping someone in a relationship that aren't necessarily in their control. They may be dependent on them, as I mentioned, disability, but there are also lots of cultural issues. Um, and it may be that someone, for example, a good, a good one actually, is that some women are in this country on a spousal visa because their husband's got a work visa. So they may not be able to leave very readily and that makes it really difficult for them. We've worked with women who've lived in their cars outside their house so that they can make themselves safe from the relationship but still care for their children. They may be very isolated from friends and family. They may be concerned that their children will be harmed. They may be concerned that disclosing might harm the perpetrator. So it may be that if it's, say for example, it's their child that's harming them, even if that child's an adult, they may still want to care for their child and they may understand what's going on for their child. They may not want the police coming and arresting them and getting them in trouble. They may be in denial of the impact. You know, it's a really, really real thing. Professor Liz Kelly's work tells us that distorting your reality is a coping mechanism. So denial is a way that you cope and you may not really have it in your conscious awareness that you're really suffering and so are your kids. You may experience stigma. You may get an unsympathetic response. And that's why we talk about the help seeking and the way that we approach someone seeking of help being really, really essential in how we handle those because otherwise we could drive someone right back into denial or right back into that shame and self-blame. Oh, no one wants to help me because it is my fault or I'm not good enough. And there are intersecting issues. So we've spoken a bit about culture. Um, it may be that someone's age, so inter intersectionality is about oppressions coming together to make it even harder for someone to, to cope with oppression and difficult situations. So age can be a confounding factor. Are we dealing with someone who, for example, has developed dementia and there's abuse now as a result of the dementia? So we need to look at that separately. Or are we dealing with an older person who's lived with abuse all of their life from this other and is, is not feeling like that any change is possible for them? Disability. So people with disabilities can become entrapped in relationships more frequently and with greater harm potentially. 
poverty is an intersecting issue? Do you have the resources to go off and start a new life? Are you financially dependent on someone even if you're not in a poverty situation? You know, very often people in, in wealthier situations may be trapped by their financial dependency. Their social status may trap them. They may feel that they can't take their children away from all the things that they have, the connections, the opportunities in life. And so they tolerate risk. Those from the LGBT communities, these intersections come about to um, further exacerbate coercion and control. So we have to look at all of these potentially confounding barriers and understand that leaving, telling and freedom are not easy to achieve. Now this quote refers to a woman, but it could also be a man. It could be someone staying in a relationship because the alternative might be even more dangerous. And the reality is that that is true. Leaving a relationship the first year after leaving, if the relationship is coercively controlling, is a really high risk time. If there are stalking behaviours, it's a really high risk time. If there's pregnancy, it can be higher risk. So we have to really think about the fact that leaving is difficult. It isn't as easy as us saying it out loud, which sometimes we might feel it is and that they may be managing their own safety in a way that suits them best. So what happens if someone discloses to you? Well, you have to listen carefully. You have to validate someone's feelings. Tell them that you can help. Ask them whether they're in immediate danger. Call 999 if they are. Ask if you would like to, them to refer you for support if you can. If you can't, then, or it's no, they don't want you to, just at least let them know about the website in Kent and Medway so they know where to look. If you can refer them on, take their name and phone number and use the helplines, Kent and Medway ones, there's two separate, look on the website, pass on their details. Be compassionate, change is not easy. So the model, we ask about abuse, we validate, we document where necessary, depending on our processes or the situation that we find ourselves receiving a disclosure in and we respond and refer. Normalise the question. It's all right. You know, I'm not bringing my own stress and anxiety to this. Always ask in private. There's no point asking in front of someone's partner or family because they won't tell you necessarily. Discuss your confidentiality and the limits to that. Use non-judgmental tones and language. Just frame what you say carefully and really practice and think about what your own words and style for asking are. How are things at home? How do you resolve arguments at home? What happens if you have a disagreement with your partner? How does that turn out? So just think about what you can say and how you can say it. That's just a straightforward question that gives someone the space to answer. And the reality is, if someone is not happy that you've asked them, that's fine. Ask nevertheless, because there's someone there in front of you at times who's wishing you would. Notice their language. It can be very minimising. They might say, oh, it's not their fault. They're, they can be really lovely. It was my fault. It's only when they drink. Things like this really tell us that someone might be minimising what's happening to them. And when I say minimising, what I mean is they might be really not in that ready for change place. So they're still maybe distorting reality. They're still trying to focus on the positives because the thought of change might be too big at the moment. That doesn't mean that you can't still say, I feel worried about you. And that's validating. So some of these statements are about providing validating messages, acknowledging that domestic abuse is wrong and confirming the person's worth. Now, these are a couple of quotes um, that allow us to see how important it is to respond in the right way. And I've highlighted there, it's like a seed was planted because if that person doesn't change for two, three, four, five years, those seeds you plant along the way are going to build them up the opportunity to do that. And sometimes our role is just to sit back and wait and try to 
support them on that journey of change. We have to respect their autonomy and choices. We might gradually enable them to become empowered. People tell us that this is what they want. They want to be heard and believed. They want the time to change in their own way. They want good quality information about their options and they want confidentiality. They don't want the world to know their business. There's a lot of shame in these situations. And we have to work really carefully with that because the emotional and psychological impacts of shame are quite profound. So we document, we make sure we write down, if we're in that situation, if we're in a professional situation, we write down things, things that can actually be used for victimless prosecutions, for example. Um, it's really important that the onus is not placed on those that are victimised to carry the weight of a prosecution of a perpetrator. We have to hold them accountable. Documenting is a safeguarding technique and practice, but it's also maybe a way of building a picture um, and allowing someone to be held to account for what they're doing because it's wrong. And let's roll with resistance. We have to remember we're sowing the seeds of change. We cannot force it. Our role is to remain available. It can take someone up to seven years to leave an abusive relationship and they may return when they leave. We can't judge that. We just have to sit that out and always be there because if someone feels that we've been compassionate and non-judgmental, they'll know they can come back to us. So this is the Domestic Abuse Services website for Kent and Medway. And on here, as you see from that image, you can hover over any district and you'll be able to click on that district or Medway, the unitary authority, and see what services are available there. So you can find the services in that area by using the interactive map and you'll see the relevant details for one stop shops, helpline numbers and so on. Thanks for taking part in the training.